Hello there, thank you for joining us from wherever you are. We're coming to you live from our studios in Kokomlimle on digital address GA0992539. Our top stories this hour. Baby and Mother's Unit of the Konfanoji Teaching Hospital to be completed in three years after it was abandoned for 47 years. We'll take you down memory lane of the Joy News story detailing how at least four babies died due to congestion at the hospital between 2012 and 2016 as we share the good news with you. Most coming up, the Ghana Immigration Service makes several arrests of neighboring nationals smuggling themselves into the country as our main as our borders remain shut in response to coronavirus. We'll take you this afternoon to the Western Bono and the Volta regions where close to 100 people have been taken in. And a semblance of normalcy or a risky move. This week, one of Euro's biggest leagues resumed, the Bundesliga. Exciting, but how will it be, given that the virus is still spreading? We're live in Germany for those fine details. Those are top stories this hour. My name is Gifty Andopia. This is The Pulse. Please be my guest. I'll take you through the details now. In three years, the mother and baby unit of the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital, abandoned for 47 years, will be completed. Within 2012 and 2016, an average of 115 mothers lost their lives annually at that hospital. That's not all. At least four babies also died each day due to factors including congestion and infections. This is the highlight of a Joy News special assignment in 2017. Seth Kwame Boateng has more in this report as he takes you on a journey about how it all began. Lives were being lost on a daily basis as a result of congestion here at the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital, Ghana's second biggest teaching hospital. Yeah, our mortality rates have all, have, are around 20%, which means that a fifth of the babies who come in will end up dying. Um, so that, that would try baby what? You know, on, on, on a bad day, we can lose six, seven babies. Uh, we've had days when we've lost as many as 10 in a day. These heart wrenching statistics from Dr. Jikua Planjru, head of the hospital's mother and baby unit, were not the only worrying fact about the facility. Expectant mothers also had their share, according to the former head of the gynecology unit of the hospital, Professor Bafu Opoku. In 2012, we had 152 deaths. Mothers. Mothers. 2013, 126. 2014, 108. 2015, 102. And last year was 91. All these were as a result of congestion. Congestion that made women in labor join queues and each wait her turn to give birth. Some of them will deliver in the corridors. And it's not the best because you have to be in a particular position to ensure effective, safe delivery. So assuming the woman is standing and the baby just drops onto the ground, apart from the baby sustaining injuries, the mother will also sustain what we call genital tract injuries. This same congestion meant doctors and nurses at the mother and baby unit had to put up to four babies in one cot or incubator. Each of these babies is carrying his own set of bacteria and then they are sharing. They are passing them on to one another. How dangerous so is that? Baby may come in with, you know, your baby may come in with one infection and then just as he's getting well and he's about to go home, he picks another one from his cot mate and, 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 you know, sometimes maybe, I mean, babe, as, I, as I said, babies can die of infections very easily. A few meters away from where these avoidable deaths were being recorded was the perceived panacea to the congestion. An almost thousand bed maternity and child health unit started in 1974 but had been abandoned. This didn't sound right. We need not play politics with our health and in particular this building because all the governments have come and gone. None has been able to just finish this to take care of the people who go and queue to vote for them every year, mm -hmm. especially our mothers and children who make up the largest population of this country besides the men. These concerns triggered the Next to Die documentary, which was first broadcast on 13th March 2017. <laughs> This 
documentary shook people in Ghana and beyond, and it made many people angry. Angry at the reality of mothers losing their babies after nine months of pregnancy. <laughs> And uh, we, we sincerely apologize you're having to relive this uh, rather sad experience. Uh, this is third time referral to Konfuanoche and the experience is almost the same. The public discourse on the blatant neglect of this facility continued for weeks and this compelled President Ekufuado to visit the hospital to obtain first-hand accounts of the situation. It was Saturday 1st April 2017 and this is what he wrote in the hospital's visitor's book. I am very distressed at what I have seen here today. It is not to the credit of our nation that an important hospital project, Kath Maternity Block, should stand 44 years uncompleted. We have to do something about it, and I intend to do so. Contractors who were working on the project had told Joy News about $75 million was needed to complete the project. They could finish the project in two years. These two years waiting period meant more deaths, so the multimedia group and the First Lady Rebecca Kufado had to intervene and raise approximately $2 million to construct an emergency ultra-modern maternity and mother and baby unit in a record time of six months. I saw drawings of it, but um, I didn't know this is how it would turn out. I'm really amazed and overjoyed at, at what I see today. And indeed, this facility helped to significantly improve the situation, save lives. But to further reduce the deaths, the abandoned 47-year-old building needs to be completed. Government has secured two credit agreements from the Deutsche Bank and the UK Export Finance, totaling 155 million euros to continue the project. Parliament approved this loan on 12 April 2019. All is set now for work to start on the facility, and on Friday, 15 May, President Ekufuado will cut sword for work to continue on the project. The chief executive of the Konfonochi Teaching Hospital, Dr. Hineba Wusudam, says this would be the best gift the hospital would have ever received. The fact that it is a facility within the center of Ghana that offers some unique specialized uh, services that most regions don't have. The entire five regions in the, in the north, their referrals come to us, even including the central region. So we need that facility to actually expand. In fact, where we are, as I've always indicated, the accident and emergency center in Confederate Hospital is almost always full. It's all because we are getting referrals here every minute, every hour, because of the lack of facilities in all the uh, regional areas that I have uh, just uh, indicated. And therefore, we need to have a very um, good space to transfer the patients out of the emergency area beyond their emergency care. And that is why the incoming project is very, very critical. Well, from the multimedia group, we would want to thank you all for helping us push this agenda for better health for the mothers and babies in and around the Ashanti region. Well, all the problems are set highlighted in that report should soon end because today, President Akufado cut sought for the continuation of the mother and baby unit block started many years ago. We'll hear from the president, health minister and other officials who spoke at the sword cutting ceremony. But let's give uh, let's go live to Kumasi and speak with Sep Kwame Boating, whose documentary and whose special assignments, I should say, brought this discussion to the fore. Seth, what is happening at the moment? Ended a while ago and um, we have all left the Confinochi Teaching Hospital, but the people there, the health staff there and the patients are still excited because uh, when this project is over in three years, it's going to bring them the relief they've been looking for for so many years. So the excitement is still there. And I, I wouldn't say only the, uh, the Confinochi Teaching Hospital, but uh, the, the entire Kumasi, uh, you, you, people we saw around were excited. They were cheering the present up and uh, Asantene up. And they are all excited about this project, uh, but we have since left Confinochi and I'm reporting live 
from the uh, offices here in Kumasi. Now that in Kumasi people love to talk, I mean, uh, I'm wondering what sort of talk is going on there in Kumasi as far as what has happened today uh, is concerned, Kwame? I think until the president made it clear that every single money they need to complete this project uh, is here, it's available, uh, people were still skeptical because it's been 47 years yeah. since this project started and it, it, it contractors will work on it to a point, they will stop, they will say there's no money. And I remember when we did the, the uh, Next to Die documentary, contractors who had previously worked on the project who were still on site waiting that one day uh, funding will come uh, for them to continue. They had said they needed approximately $75 million to complete. And this wasn't uh, a small amount government could gather in a matter of weeks or months. Uh, so people were skeptical, but when the president came and said every single money they need to complete this project is ready and it's in Ghana, then it brought some kind of relief. Um, and you could see on the faces of people, a few of the people who were there, that indeed this project is going to be ready in the three years estimated time that the contractors have given. So yes, they are now rest assured and we are all praying and hoping that nothing changes uh, so that in three years this facility will be ready for the people, not only of Ashanti region, but the, when the health minister was speaking, I remember he said that this facility is going to serve 12 other regions. Uh, so it's going to benefit the entire country. Well, Kwame, it's interesting that you mentioned the health minister because I'm going to bring his uh what he said and then after that we'll continue our conversation with you so let's listen to the health minister who was speaking today at the sword cutting ceremony mr president we don't even know exactly how many years this project started some are saying 40 i told yesterday say 40 some are saying 42 some are saying 47 and the original minister summed it up over 40 years this it's a typical example of an abandoned project. This is what we should call an abandoned project. Not the little, little ones we have come to finish almost all of them. And they wouldn't talk about this. Mr. President, we thank you so much. The original minister, because this is his kingdom, sorry, Nana Utunfo, I'm sorry. This is his area. He said the people of Ashanti are thanking the president for this. No! All of us, to the north of Ghana, beyond Ashanti, this is our tertiary referral facility. So those of us in Bro, Ahafu, some parts of Oti, some parts of Savannah, even some parts of the north, this is where we come. So not only the people of Ashanti are grateful to you, president, all of us, I am grateful to you. And me as the health minister, I will say all of us in this country are grateful to you with your commitment to strengthen health systems in our country for us to achieve our key performance indicators in health that we are striving to achieve in 2021. Mr. President, when we saw the documentary, especially me, that was put up on Joy FM by Seth Kwame Bwati, which motivated your wife, Antonio Baker, to come and do what she did there. You continue to push me, and I was pushing my young people in the ministry. I just want to announce to you, Your Excellency, that that man said Kwame Bwatin is here with us today. And I believe he will take the news along that what he did just fall in line with Nanado's thinking and commitment, and we have seen what we are seeing here today. I said earlier on that, have we not seen COVID-19? This project will have started long before now. But when we sit down and think that COVID-19 is going to go away before we come and do this short cutting, then it means that our prediction wouldn't come true. COVID-19 has come to stay with us. It will have nowhere to go very, very, very soon. Especially when we haven't developed any vaccine, when nobody knows it is serious cure directly towards it, we have to learn to live with it so we can live our normal lives. So we can live our normal lives. We can't allow COVID-19 to keep us indoors forever. 
and certainly exactly what government is doing, living our normal lives. And that's, that includes bringing up this building you see right here behind me. That's the health minister. Seth is still on the line with me, but I want you to listen to the CEO of Konfonochi Teaching Hospital, uh, Dr. Hene Danso. For a project whose initial sword cutting ceremony was done in 1976, I wish on behalf of the K88 family to give thanks to the Almighty God for making it possible for us to see this day. As a hospital, we have been dreaming about the completion and use of the Maternity and Children's Book Project for an incredible 44 long years. In fact, it was started five years before I entered the medical school at the KNUST. Thanks to the bold and decisive leadership of Your Excellency President Kufuado, one of the longest dreams in the country's health sector is about to be fulfilled with the reactivation and real completion of works on this project under a contract awarded to Contractor Construction UK Limited. By virtue of this, the hospital will boast of one of the most modern women and children's medical facilities in the world when completed. The 800 bed project, among others, will have emergency reception for children and pregnant women, 10 theaters, intensive care units, an individual fertilization unit, breastfeeding center, pediatric surgery unit, pharmacy, dedicated medical oxygen plant, lecture halls, cafeteria, gift shop and bank, and other specialty facilities. Upon completion, this project is expected to revolutionize the provision of maternal and pediatric care in this part of the country and make the hospital a formidable center of excellence in the training of specialist health professionals in Ghana and uh, sub-Saharan Africa. The hospital has a significant training population from Africa, especially from the sub-region of West Africa. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as we have gathered here to witness the result of works for the largest single investment in the history of this hospital since its construction in 1954, I wish to enjoin the people of this region and indeed the millions of Ghanaians living in these catchment areas to thank His Excellency President Nana Adudan Kofuado for his historic intervention. And you'll hear from the president, Nanadu Dankwa Kufuado, but let me go back to Seth. Seth, the doctor, uh, the, the CEO talks about the investment that's been made into this hospital. And of course, this hospital serves a lot, a lot of people, not just in the, in the Ashanti region. The first lady uh, erected a temporary structure, I mean, a building that was also for uh, this purpose. Give us an update on how that is helping deal with the situation, even as we wait for this bigger uh, facility. So uh, beginning of this year, I, I was at Confonochi to do uh, two years of the facility, as in the impact it has made. And I, I got the data and it showed how one, uh, maternal mortality had reduced because now they have nine birthing beds plus three surgical theaters. Remember in the past, they had just two uh, uh, beds women were delivering on. And so anytime more than or about five women came, they could take care of only two and tell the three, wait, don't deliver yet, even though uh, the baby is coming, wait, uh, so that we can sort out the two on the bed uh, before you allow the baby to come. So there were instances, some delivered on the floor. Uh, but and they, that time when I was doing this documentary, they had just two surgical theaters for caesarean sessions. And I remember when I went, one had broken down. So all the emergency cases coming, all the women who were in need of CS, they were also having to, make, uh, to join Q before they could be operated on because one was not functioning but with the mother and baby units that the multimedia group and the first lady together built they have three operation, uh, operational theaters taking care of women so now they have 12 places of the nine beds plus the three surgical theaters where they can have their babies and i remember so that has drastically reduced maternal mortality now there's no delay you come in and you deliver straight away you don't have to join any queue and i remember the mother and baby unit the old one they um, that place was built to accommodate just 60 babies but as at the time we were doing this documentary they were taking over 120 babies so there were instances four babies six babies were having to share court and incubators so cross infection was high so, but when this new facility was built they they have about 120 baby courts right. they had about 10 incubators so when you go there no matter the congestion 
you not find a, any baby sharing any court. At times, you only find twins. That under rare circumstances, you find twins in one court. But mm. uh, that is when there is even congestion there. Otherwise, they are not having to share court. And I was told that that had also reduced uh, neonatal mortality. Okay. And I remember still birth had drastically come down. It has halved by 50%. It has come down by 50%. That was the statistics I was given. Right, so, and I remember Dr. Planjou uh, telling me that, um, look at what we've been able to do with this letter that we have. And imagine uh, government is able to complete this huge facility for us, the miracles that can mm -hmm. happen in this hospital. That's why they're excited that the president is in Kumasi today and has been able to cast sword uh, for work on the project to, to, to start. Well, Kwame, I'll come back to you and wrap up finally. Let's listen to President Kufado today when he cut the sword for this building to continue. Today, the virus notwithstanding, to cut the sword for work to begin finally to complete this ultra-modern maternity and children block. A project which is to be carried out within 36 months and whose funding has been fully secured. Once it is put up, the maternity and children's block will be a state-of-the-art modern health edifice with pediatrics, gynecology, and obstructive units. It will serve as a referral center for 12 of the 16 regions of our country. It will be a 750-bed building with outpatient areas for adults and children, and it will have 10 operating theaters and diagnostic rooms, fully equipped with X-ray, ultrasound, and mammography facilities. It will house an intensive care unit, a high dependency unit, isolation rooms, and student lecture halls, with the capacity to provide catering services for staff, patients, and students. As you all know, in addition to being President of the Republic, I'm also privileged to act as co-chair of the group of eminent advocates for the 2030 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The finalization of this project is as very dear to my heart as it will have a positive impact on our country's drive towards achieving the SDG targets under maternal and child health. Government is aware, as underlined by the Chief Exec Executive, that one of the critical challenges confronting teaching hospitals in our country, like Confranachi, has to do with the unavailability of land for future expansion. I'm privy to the discussions that are taking place between Menshia and the board of this hospital for the possible release of additional lands for other projects such as the Centers of Excellence for Cardiothoracic, Renal, Organ Transplant, Infectious Disease and Diagnostic Services, among others. The people of this region, and indeed the entire country, look forward eagerly to the conclusion and implementation of these discussions. Accordingly, ladies and gentlemen, I hereby declare the, construc the construction of the Confranochi Teaching Hospital Maternity and Children's Block duly reactivated. And I hope the project implementation team will work diligently and accomplish the project within the stipulated time on budget, as I'm confident they will. And that's uh, President Kufwadu who cut the sword earlier today. I take a very final word from Seth Kwame Boating, who is still in Kumasi, joining us live. Kwame, we've heard from the president and all that's been uh, that he, he intends to do, including the expansion for other services. But before you go, I want you to just tell me when they say that the uh, the money is not going to be a problem this time around. Do we know the source and has the money been given already to the contractor, to the hospital? I mean, tell us, where is the money coming from and where is it at the moment? So government uh, got this money from two banks, um, the Deutsche Bank and the UK Financing, and it's 155 million euros. And when I spoke to the contractors, they told me they have the money. 
uh, meaning uh, nothing will stop them from starting the project or continuing the project. They told me the money is there. So it's not now that they are going to look for the money. And so uh, I should not have any problem with uh, whether they will have challenges or not on money. It is there. And I had that assurance from them. For our eagle eyes on that, certainly with you. And hopefully in three years, as they say, we will be uh, commissioning that building. And I can't wait for that excitement uh, on the faces of the mothers and the children there. Thank you, Seth. Seth Kwame Boating there, deputy head of our health desk and also the person who did that documentary. You're still watching The Pulse with me, Gifty Ando, up here. I take a break. When I return, I take you to immigration, uh, specific immigration post and what's been done there. Well, about 100, close to 100 people have been taken in. They were all smuggling themselves into the country, even though our borders are shut in response to coronavirus. Do stay with us. Welcome back to the show. Many thanks for staying with us. Now the news has spread wide and fast and the German Premier League is back, but coronavirus is still spreading. So exactly how do authorities intend to pull through the resumption of the Bundesliga? Thomas Sparrow, his political correspondent with our partners DW, has been talking to us about this, I think, for some time now. He joins us as the day draws closer for the start of the league itself. Thomas, it's good to have you. Good afternoon. Now, it looks like there's no turning back, although some people may have thought that minds would change. Well, what can you report about this? There is a big protocol in place, Gifty, for the resumption of the Bundesliga here tomorrow. Let's not forget that this is the first of the big European football leagues to restart. So it's also a decision that's being watched very closely across the continent and I would say also in other continents as to how that resumption will actually take place. When we talk about that protocol that has been announced, uh, it is a very detailed protocol which establishes absolutely everything regarding related to the matches before, during and afterwards. So what, for example, teams are allowed to do before the games. Uh, teams, for example, are supposed to be in a sort of isolation a few days before the match as well. There's going to be thousands of coronavirus tests on players also shortly before matches to determine whether they are negative or positive. Even the balls have to be uh, cleaned and uh, disinfected. Players will not be able to shake hands or take photos before the, the match. They will have to arrive separately to the stadium. Uh, the protocol also establishes the maximum number of people in one specific area of the stadium. And let's not forget as well that the matches will be without spectators. So that is something that is also being uh, established and regulated. As I say, it's been established and regulated up to the, la the most minimum detail how this is going to resume. That hasn't stopped people, however, from being very critical of this. And I would like to also reveal this because there's a poll here in Germany which was uh, presented this week, which revealed that a majority of Germans actually believe that the resumption of the Bundesliga is the wrong decision. 56% said that they're against the resumption of the Bundesliga. And there are various reasons we can go into them, Gifty, as to mm -hmm. why people believe that this is probably not the correct time to resume football matches. And that's why we asked the question whether this is a risky move uh, or, or, or not, whether we're just trying to live, by all means, live a normal life, uh, or whether this is a risky move. So, so you said, what, 56% of Germans think that this is a wrong move. What are their reasons? So those who are in favor, those who say that the, that the Bundesliga should indeed resume, say, for example, that this will help clubs economically, say that this is also something that could help the Bundesliga as an institution because everywhere around the world people will be looking at the matches, whereas in other circumstances they would have other leagues to watch as well. And they also say that this can provide some distraction for fans around the world who have otherwise been rather busy and rather concerned about the overall economic situation with the coronavirus. So those are the 
the arguments in favor for the resumption. Those who are against the resumption of the Bundesliga say that, for example, economic uh, arguments have been more important in the decision that sporting or sport arguments. They say that, uh, for example, this is also a very risky decision from a public health perspective. And they say that the focus has been put maybe on the wrong part of society. There has been a lot of criticism that this has, there has been a big discussion about the resumption of the Bundesliga, where the other elements, for example, uh, exactly how um, nurseries and daycare centers will reopen has not received so much attention. So there has been criticism in that regard as well. Again, these uh, polls reveal that most Germans are actually against that uh, decision, even though many people here in Germany are actually uh, big fans of the Bundesliga. But there is certain concern that this is maybe too much of a risk too early. Too much of a risk too early. They tell us that this is going to happen uh, without spectators, right? But we also know that there's going to be some sort of um, fake if you like spectator sounds i mean can you give us an idea how they intend to do this how will it look like a mental picture that's exactly that's exactly the case gifty uh, you won't have the spectators in the stadium but um, football matches will be broadcast and the idea for fans is at home uh, to try and have as good an experience as possible obviously considering the circumstances because it's going to be a very strange resumption of the Bundesliga when you consider that there will be no fans in the stadium fans are also not allowed to gather uh, surrounding the stadium that's also banned you may know that uh, social distancing measures here in Germany only allow people from two households to meet maximum so you won't have groups of fans watching uh, football matches and also bars for example are still closed here um, so that's one element which will give you an idea of what the type of, of, of football match will be like. And at the same time, I think many players are also aware that they have a big responsibility when it comes to, to these football matches. There's a lot of interest uh, here involved. There are a, a lot of concerns also here involved when it comes to the resumption of the Bundesliga. And as I said earlier, this is something that's being watched very closely abroad because most international leagues, not only here in Europe but around the world, are also discussing these same issues. How exactly and when can they resume the matches and under what circumstances, in particular when it comes to these uh, protocols that we've been discussing of hygiene and security? Yeah. yeah. And, and I take you back to some of the things that you said, Thomas, before we go. You indicated that the te the, the, uh, there's supposed to be tests, regular tests for these players. But usually the tests are, are, are not instant. You don't get the results instantly, unless, of course, there is some instant results uh, uh, testing that goes on there. But otherwise, how would they know that they've been they, they, they've tested but they're positive or negative and I mean what sort of arrangement is there and will they be for example wearing masks while they're playing no, they won't be wearing masks while they're playing, but everyone on the sidelines will have to wear masks if at all possible. So, for example, the manager and the uh, players uh, on the bench will have to wear a, a mask. Obviously, when the, when the manager shouts something to the players, he will have to take his mask off. But in general, everyone who's not on the pitch will have to wear a, a mask. And regarding the tests, there are thousands of tests that are going to be um, used for, for players, and players will have to pass several tests uh, negative test before actually being allowed to play. They will also have a very strict quarantine. And I would like just to share one example that came out just uh, today or in the last few hours of one manager who decided to uh, leave the isolation of the team before the match to try and buy some toothpaste. And, and uh, because he was found outside of his hotel, concentration of the hotel isolation, he will not be able to join uh, the match tomorrow and he will mm. have to be tested once again. So that gives you an idea of how this is happening. There have been tests that have resulted positive and in many cases those players have been isolated. But for example, in Germany, second division, one complete team was quarantined after a few players tested positive. That team, Dynamo Dresden, will not be able to play in the second tier of German football this weekend. They won't be able to play the next weekend either so that just gives you an idea gift you of how mm. difficult this mm. is this is under no circumstance a very easy solution for german football it is a very risky endeavor and that's why so many people are actually concerned certainly it is a lot of people are excited i mean it's been a long time since we've been out of the normal life that we know so it looks like people are eager to get back to that normalcy but it is still risky. Thomas, thank you so much. I'm sure that uh, by next week we'll be talking about this again and how the first part of it went.
Thomas Farrow is political correspondent with our partners DW. He joined me with uh, news about how the Bundesliga's resumption is going to look like um, in Europe as they start this weekend. Well, let's take a look at coronavirus and what it's done over the, around the world, the world emitter. Four million five hundred and seventy thousand two hundred and ten cases so far. Three hundred and four thousand eight hundred and fifty five people have died, but one million seven hundred and twenty six thousand three hundred and seven people have recovered. You can just go right ahead uh, onto your computer and take a look at the world meter if you want to check by country the details are there i'm moving on with my immigration story but just some of you have been sending your your thoughts on the kumasi uh, uh for an teaching hospital let me just read some of them to you says gifts i want to comment to kwame Boateng in particular and multimedia in general for the good works they're doing for mother ghana divine afide afide menu sent that from uh from bando Farouk in Tamale says it is good our taxes are being used to complete the project, which is, of course, a good thing. Sechere Salisu says, uh, Sechere Salisu from Power, Uti region, says, can't those who are against the new, well, you're talking about voters register, advise their members to stay off the exercise? Okay, well, let's take a look at those who are talking about um, that hospital. Says, good. Uh, afternoon gifty we hope this reactivation of the baby and mother's maternity block will not be abandoned after election or change of government because some of this some of these yeah, empty promises are too much from Nwesan Obed Azabzugu in the northern region let me tell you about what's happening on the immigration front now the Ghana immigration service will start in the western region has arrested 42 foreign nationals for entering and leaving the country through unapproved routes in the Jomoro municipality the new arrest and repatriation brings to a total of 372 interceptions in the western region alone since the closure of the country's borders there is more in this report by Inathalia Kwanza Officials of the Immigration Service in Harfasini, in the Jomoro municipality of the Western Region, have intercepted and prevented 13 persons who allegedly were leaving the country through an approved route near Akpelenuvia, Ghana's western border. The 13 persons include 12 Burkina Bay nationals, a Ghanaian, and a baby belonging to one of the two Burkina Bay women. They were intercepted and prevented from leaving Ghana to Ivory Coast on Tuesday by a team of immigration officers on their usual patrol at some unapproved routes. Western Regional Public Affairs Officer of the Ghana Immigration Service, Moses Manford Akapo says, but for the swiftness of the patrol officers, the travelers could not have been intercepted at the various points. On the 12th of May, our half as new commander led a team of immigration officers under his command to intercept 13 ECOWAS nationals. Uh, 12 out of the 13 were Burkinabis and a Ghanaian. Again on the 13th, which is the following day, just yesterday, a number of arrests and interceptions were equally made. Just and just morning. this morning, additional seven Burkinabis have been arrested, bringing the total number of interceptions within the space of three days to 42. Uh, 13 of the first arrests have been quarantined. And just this morning, additional seven have been brought in. We are about to interrogate them and uh, know where they are coming from and what have you. But I can confirm that the additional seven are Burkina Bay nationals. So far, we've intercepted uh, over 300 uh, ECOWAS nationals. Samples of the 13 have since been taken, put under quarantine, awaiting results, which will eventually inform the next line of action by the municipal.
In Natalia Kwanza with our report from the Western Region, I'll take you away from the Western Region to Bono with 20 foreign nationals, including one female traveling from Cote d'Ivoire to Kumasi and Techiman, have been arrested at Kato near Brekum. The foreigners who used an approved route to enter Ghana are nationals from neighboring countries, including Burkina Faso and Togo. They tried inducing immigration officers with 100 cities each to enable them to have a smooth pass, but they were stopped at the immigration checkpoint at Kato. This number adds to the over for 1,000 repatriated foreigners who entered the Bono region since Ghana's borders were closed uh, due to coronavirus. More from Precious Semebo. Ghana's borders remain closed as the coronavirus cases near 6,000 with one confirmed case in Sampa in the Bono region. But some foreigners continue to explore illegal means to enter the country. 20 of such people who entered Ghana from Cote d'Ivoire through Doma and Sampa in the Doma district and German North district have been arrested Thursday afternoon at Kato checkpoint near Brekum. Assistant Superintendent of Immigration Isaac Osei Asamoa has been speaking to Joy News. As you can see now, you can see them. A lot of them here from Togo, Burkina and then the rest Cote d'Ivoire other countries. When you get here, the, the bus will stop and then they will come down and then walk. So whilst they are working, we will be picking them one by one and then we will be asking them questions. That's what we call profiling. So whilst we profile them, we get to know that, okay, this person is from this country, this person is from this country. For us, it stands now, we have about 20 people. They've given us the specific places that they passed. We will take them back to wherever they are coming from. We have, we have, we have the gun thermometer here, so we check them ourselves. If your temperature is high, then we call the health people to also come in. Um, when they get to Cote d'Ivoire border, they pay their way out. Last Friday, we intercepted seven people, and then what they told us was the, they, they took 10,000 CIFAR it from them, and then they will show them the route to enter the country. So when they get here, and then we also intercept them. They will try to pay their ways out, which we don't agree to those things. Some transport operators take money to help them beat the gaze of Ghanaian immigration officers by sharing them on minibuses traveling from Doma and Sampa through Sunyane to their final destinations. Bono Regional Commander of Immigration, Assistant Commissioner of Immigration Charles Yaobediaku, told Joy News over 1,000 foreigners have been intercepted and repatriated since the border was closed in the region. We mounted a checkpoint on the Sunyane Brekum Highway at a place called Kato. Since we mounted that checkpoint, we have intercepted 125 foreigners and repatriated them. A lot of Togolese in Cote d'Ivoire, they want to come through Ghana to, Cote, uh, to Togo. So they don't have any means to come but to use the unapproved routes. Since the border was closed, we have intercepted and repatriated 1,089 people, and that is foreigners. Now, we have a place like Gonokrum. 62 of foreigners have been intercepted and repatriated. In Grand Quanta, in the Doma West, 221 uh, foreigners. Sampa has repatriated 272. Kofi Badukrum has done 133. We also have Atuna, Tanso, Checkpoint at Wenchi and others. He had this advice to Ghanaians living along the borders. Uh, unfortunate thing is, those border residents, sometimes they aid the foreigners to enter the country. They use motorbikes and other means and they create unapproved routes to get the people into the country. Uh, because of that, a place like uh, Nkran Kwanta, the commander there seized about 21 motorbikes. And these persons were just carrying people from Cote d'Ivoire to Ghana. They are thinking about the money they will get from these people without thinking about the effects of the disease and the virus. Then that is very unfortunate. So we are appealing to our border residents. They are part of us. We are one. For Joy News, Precious Semevo, Brekum.
Let's go to the Togo border. Immigration officials there intercepted 31 parcels suspected to be narcotic drugs from six Ghanaians who attempted crossing an unapproved route into Togo. The suspects fled into Togo, which made it impossible for the officials to arrest them. Sector Commander Chief Superintendent Fred Dodu joins me on the phone to share some more details uh, with us. Sir, thank you for your time this afternoon. Can you confirm to us uh, if indeed your men intercepted the, uh, uh, these, this, this substance? Were they able to uh, take the substance away from these people who were carrying it? Yes, uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity and good afternoon to you. Uh, and your Chinese citizens and viewers. Yes, uh, this. Please go ahead, sir. We can hear you. Uh, this this morning, mm -hmm. around uh, zero one twenty hours, that is uh, uh, just after midnight mm -hmm. or one a.m., uh, the men on patrols at the, one of the unapproved routes called uh, Beat Eleven uh, saw this man who they suspected. We're trying to smuggle some goods into to Togo. So uh, they gave them a, a hot chase, and uh, unfortunately, they were almost at the Togo side of the border. Uh, they were able to abscond and then enter uh, Togo. So they entered so, Togo? Unfortunately, they, unfortunately for us, they uh, were able to uh, get uh, uh, the goods. Uh, they, 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 they left it behind, and then the officers uh, uh, collected them and then brought them uh, to the main border. So you have, you've confiscated the narcotics, but the people managed to run away? Yes, the people uh, managed to run away into Togo. Mm. What, what sort of collaborations do you have with your colleagues on the other side of the border, so that by now, if you have sent them uh, an alert, they would have been able to uh, arrest them for you? Has that been done? Uh, no, please. Uh, unfortunately, that side of the, uh, of the border at that time, they didn't have any uh, Togo uh, police men around. Uh, it, it is uh, a bush, uh, a bush way. Mm. So uh, they were able to sneak in the uh, in the night and then enter. Like I, like I mentioned, one uh, one uh, one day. Mm. So they are, yeah, we've not been able to uh, contact them to be able to trace them. In, in that case, what, what's going to happen next? Are you going to launch some sort of investigation or do you, are you leaving it there? Uh, now, what we've done is to hand over uh, uh, the 31 parcels of uh, uh, substance, uh, substances to NAPO. Uh, they are the mandated agents to uh, handle uh, search this. Mm. So we've, we've handed it over uh, to NAPO to carry on from there. We, 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 we're hearing that uh, since the border was closed that it significantly reduced the level of smuggling uh, at the Aflao border. How true is this? To what extent is that true? Yes, it is. Uh, I can say uh, it is true because uh, uh, the men are there 24, 24 hours. And then uh, uh, those uh, uh, border residents who are assisting them uh, we'll be able to do a lot of community uh, engagement with the leaders of. They even uh, spot the people and then they call us and then go and then arrest them. Uh, fortunately for us, those who want to come into the country uh, uh, through the illegal means, has, uh, as of now, uh, uh, has uh, uh, gone down. down uh, uh, drastically. Uh, the challenge you now we have is those who now want to go uh, to Togo and then go and buy uh, goods and come and sell. Uh -huh. It's also happening somehow that people are still somehow able to still go through go through the illegal routes and, and get their stuff. Your men have been arresting some people, but you know, there, there is word out that some of them still money to get through to, to buy their things. How, how oh, true is this also from your perspective? Oh, yes. Uh, looking at the, the stretch from uh, the K2 South stretch from the flower border up to the end of K2 North, which is far be, uh, beyond uh, uh, Akanu and then Havi area. It's a very wide stretch. Uh -huh. uh, you know, these uh, uh, border residents, they know that they're in better because like uh, I spoke with you uh, uh, some, some, some few weeks back 
the moment you steal one, they create another one. The moment you steal one, they create another one. It is just uh, a bush path. Uh -huh. But like I said, uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, the rate at which they were going and coming has, 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 has come down drastically. Okay. Uh -huh. So now it is those uh, people like uh, the Nigerians, uh, people from Kumasi who want to find their way means of going to buy some goods and come and sell. But I believe now uh, it has gone down. The pressure has gone down. Sir, so thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Sure. Chief Superintendent Fred Dodo is a Aplau Border uh, Immigration Commander. Now, COVID-19 infections have started rising in Europe again. A few days after leaders losing social restrictions, the UK also started to ease its restrictions since Monday and announced it to continue with the Premier League sometime in June. The new cases in Germany and China and other countries that started easing restrictions illustrate the difficulties that governments will face over the next, parts, uh, the next months as they attempt to reopen their societies without triggering a second wave of infections. Well, let's go to the UK where Baba Tando joins us live with some updates there. Hello, Baba. Hi, Gifty. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Baba. It's good to have you. So uh, we know that the UK has eased some restrictions with the uh, Premier League contemplating a return um, in June. We know what's happening in Germany at the, at the moment. What more can you add? All right, yeah. Um, so the Premier League um, board has been ha you know, having a series of meetings with government officials and they have... Um, come to an agreement that the Premier League could start in June, albeit, um, you know, inconclusively. Um, all of these things have been inconclusive. The other lower leagues are also meeting up, you know, subsequently with government officials to ensure um, that they are all in, you know, in tandem as to when they can also start. And so, yes, indeed, the Premier League has been giving, you know, um, I won't say they've been given the full green light, but I mean, they've been told that the Premier League could begin in June but meetings are still ongoing to find out, you know, uh, measures that could be put in place to ensure that the COVID scare, you know, does not rise up again once, um, you know, the Premier League is, 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 is up and running. But what I've been monitoring from football fans is that um, not many of them are enthused about, you know, going back or going into the stadium to, to you know, to support their club when they are playing. Um, if you speak to about three in five people can tell you that they are not too enthusiastic about returning just yet. And so um, I don't know if they're going to start doing this behind closed doors, but not many fans are enthused about wanting to return. They may be happy watching it on TV, watching it via the internet, but to say that they are happy about wanting to go into the stadium to support their clubs, it's quite, you know, skeptical. A lot of them are skeptical about making a return, you know, um, in that regard. But they are happy. Some are happy to hear that the, that football is coming back. Though. I'm hearing. I mean, I just spoke to our, our, our partners in Germany who are telling us that the Bundesliga, about 56% of Germans think that starting the Bundesliga is a risky. Um, move. But we also know that uh, in, 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 in the UK there are conversations on who to, which team to support because of course their league is not, has not started. So I mean there must be some, there must be some level of jealousy over there given that Germany has already gone ahead to start theirs. Well, I tell you what, Germany has always been ahead of um, the UK with regards to, you know, uh, you know, uh, putting measures in place and dealing with this COVID. And so the people in the UK know that they are far behind. They are not too, I, I'm not sure there's anything called jealousy happening right now because the case in the UK is different from the case in Germany. And they would want to contain this virus. They would want to ensure that this pandemic has been hit hard. I mean, has been dealt with. Um, to the barest minimum and so there's nothing there's nothing about jealousy they want to make sure to take you one step at a time even mm. school as i mean primary schools are supposed to open from the first of june that has been problematic people are not too enthused about sending their children back to school and so it's it, i mean it's 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 it's, it's it has nothing to do with jealousy. People in the UK want this virus to be contained, and so they are not too enthused about. Yeah, they are happy about some measures, you know, being um, some of the lockdown measures being softened. But I mean, you still don't find too many people on the streets. 
yes the, the shops still have queues and all of that the traffic is building up on the roads but they are not too enthused about you know massing up in one place and um, you know or having their kids to have massing up in one place to go to school or you know to go to the stadium to 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 to, to watch football the buses the tubes the trains are getting filled up which is making um, social distancing problematic. And I mean, Boris Johnson and his people are really, really taking, they are considering serious measures. We're waiting, um, in the next one minute, the daily briefing will happen and, and we're going to hear what will be happening so far. But I mean, they are not too enthused about wanting to amass in the stadium or wanting to have their kids back in school. So there's nothing about jealousy. Mm, and I'm wondering, what, what has your personal, I mean, uh, your your personal story been how has it been for you? you you've been in lockdown for weeks well yeah i've been in lockdown for weeks um every now and then i go out to get essentials i go out so as as we speak now i'm in the car i'm going to get some essentials right now um it's it's been crazy i mean i i haven't i haven't had um too much of um of of I haven't been bothered by it so much because I know that the situation is scary. Hey, I don't want to go get no coronavirus. I don't want to go and get all the repercussions that come with it. It is it is a very precarious situation we find ourselves in. Uh, the only difficulty is standing in queues for long to get access to the bank or to get access to the to the shop. I, I had to I had to queue up for close to 30 minutes just to go into the bank to do a transaction today, and that that wasn't fun at all. That wasn't pleasing. It's usually the same when I. Have to go to the shop you queue to get into the shop once you are done picking up your items you queue at the tail you know it's, it's it's not been pleasant but other than that i mean i think i think it is okay it's not as if life has come to a standstill not really we still do things online you know and so it's it's it's, it's not much of a bother to me baba thank you very much uh along the line i'm sure we'll get back to you baba tando there uh, my colleague uh, joining us from all the way in the uk where she's given us updates on their own league we're coming back to ghana where the minority spokesperson on health kobna Minta akando is kicking against the speaker's decision to recall parliament to sit on tuesday the uh, that's the 19th of may next next week the mp is warning that the move in the light of covid 19 spread and attendant restrictions is out of place because there is no urgent business to be undertaken the speaker issued a notice last week recalling mps to work from the 19th mr kando says the move is a danger to all Ghanaians because mps could spread the virus across the country more quickly than any professionals before we come back Proper and pragmatic steps must be put in place before we come back, else we have no business coming back. And I say so because if you go to other developed countries, their parliament, they come as and when there's a, I mean, a special duty to be performed. They come in, about in groups. 50 people will appear on the floor of the house at a time to deal with a particular matter, and they will go. So for me, if you are asking people not to congregate beyond 25, and we have about 275 people in the same chamber. It makes no sense of social distancing. And so I believe that um, government, government and parliament as an institution must put in place pragmatic measures. Whether we'll be called to come and do specific duties, special ones, then we'll go. It's not as if we are coming to sit normally as though there's nothing at stake. It sounds so that the second meeting of the uh, fourth session is actually what the speaker is recalling that it begins not for any specific then, outline then I, I think that <clears throat> with the greatest respect to leadership and with the greatest respect to the speaker they must also consider our 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 lives as well our lives are in danger and i can tell you that members of parliament travel more and wide as i speak to you now this should have even been mass testing in parliament nobody knows who is carrying the virus and we must we must not behave as though we are super human beings and we cannot carry the virus the virus, I mean, we have seen prime ministers, we have seen ministers, we have seen deputy ministers who have contracted this virus. So the social distancing is not being implemented in parliament. And I believe that we must be called to do special, specific duties and be made to go home. And uh, that will serve as an example to the people. So the pastors, the pastors who are listening to the directive of the president will understand. Because there are churches who are now more than 200 or 275. They have been asked not to sit. You understand? And so they have been asked not to worship. And so I believe that before we come back, there must be proper measures. 
more than what we see or what we saw before we went on recess. Otherwise, then. Otherwise, the I believe that uh, I think that okay, we, uh, we okay. do not have to come back and sit. And because you see, after Parliament Wednesday, we go, we frequent our constituencies. Don't think about us as individuals. We meet more people in our constituencies more than any individual. Immediately, a member of Parliament goes into his constituency or her constituency. A lot of people go around the person. He moves to the communities. So even if one person contracts the disease. You can imagine how many people can be infected. Mm. And so we should not take it I mean, lightly at all. And so there must be pragmatic measures in place before we are called to parliament. We can be doing virtual meetings. I can be in my, in my office monitoring proceedings on the floor of the house. As and when I think that I must move there, fine. Then we'll do so. So we want to see more of these measures rather than calling all of us to, I mean, uh, come and uh, overcrowd on this small space the ranking member on Parliament's Health Committee wants government to change its strategy and ensure mass testing of citizens as the way to combat the disease. He claims the rise in the figures show the situation is getting out of hand and government must sit up. The issues are getting out of hand. We must do more testing. More testing. You see, when you are taking your statistics as whether or not we have peaked, you don't change your denominators your denominators must remain constant. And even the epicenters, you don't go and take samples from Jaboso and take a different sample from, let's say, Obwasi, and then you say, because the Jaboso one is dropping, it means that our cases are dropping. It doesn't make sense with all respect because the two are not the same. One is an epicenter and the other is not. So you take two samples from the same epicenters with the same denominators. When you see the positive cases dropping, that one, you can make a case out of it. But if you take different cases and then different denominators and you come out to say that we are picking worse, the cases are skyrocketing, it is rather unfortunate. It doesn't, it doesn't engender trust. Now, how to believe government in the management of this has become a problem. How to believe what government says has now become a problem. Because they say one thing in the morning, and in the afternoon, they are coming out to see a different thing. They say one thing, uh, I mean, yesterday, and today we are seeing a completely different thing, which is opposite what they said yesterday. We're still staying with the minority because they're demanding the immediate withdrawal of a directive from the Ghana Revenue Authority to the ECG to charge up to 18.1% tax on electricity tariff, noting that will impoverish Ghanaians. A fourth, uh, a fourth May 2020 circular from the GRA to ECG reportedly directed the charging of 12.5% of VAT, 2.5% of NHIL and 2.5% of Get Fund Levy, which the ECG has not been charging since March 2001, although it's mandatory on the legal books. Minority spokesperson on energy, Adam Smotowakilu, is warning the move will bring hardship to consumers who are already burdened because of COVID-19. Joseph Opoku Gakpo joins me with more on this. Hello, Joseph. Well, we don't have Joseph at the moment, but we can listen to Adam Smotowakilu. On 4th May, Ghana Revenue Authority wrote to ECG instructing ECG to apply VAT, get fund levy, and NHL levy on power supply. And we all know that this will be passed on to the final consumer. Our percentage? 18.125%. You don't add just the figures, because the way finance calculate it is that you cut you take the cost calculate get fund calculate nhil sum it and take 12.5 percent so if you do that you will have 18.125 percent and this tax has not been in existence since 2001 2001 we call it a zero rated tax it should have been applied since 2001 the President could foresaw that consumers need to have some relief, so it wasn't applied. In 2013, President, uh, President Mills inherited from President Kufo did not apply it. President Mama in 2013 re-emphasized 
why power to residential consumers should be zero rated, specific 13th of August 2013. And as such, consumers were not taxed. Since 2011, although it's on Since the 2001. 2001. Yes, so successive president hold on to the fact that we need to give some consumers some relief. Only President Nana Kufuado, not at any time, at this difficult time that Ghanaians are going through, has scrapped it and imposing it on residential consumers. We think this is insensitive. It shows the president do not care for Ghanaians, and we call on him as a matter of agency to reconsider this and withdraw it. What do you envisage the consequence on consumers will be? Consumers should expect to pay more for electricity, not only for three months, for the rest of their lives, until President Mama comes in to re-emphasize what he did in 2013. If it's captured in the legal books, why should it not be implemented to the extent that more resources are needed by companies like the ECG? Thank you very much. This is going to be pending ECG in a way. But implementation of the law must come with wise economic decisions. You don't come and tell Ghanaians that, okay, because of COVID, I'm giving you relief. At the same time, now say, let me import taxes because I need money. That is not a wise decision. Every president will wait even if you want to impose this, that economic activities pick up. People who are unemployed as a result of COVID-19 gain employment. We recover from COVID-19. Economic activities pick up, then you impose this. But not in the middle of COVID-19. And so what's your expectation of Ghanaians in terms of uh, how the nation should react to this? Because then chances are these additional charges are coming up any moment. You, me, you, we are all going to pay more. Not for three months. Don't look at the rebate or the relief. The relief is just for three months. Look at the long term. Getting to the end of the year. You will be paying more. And it is our responsibility to tell the president that, hey, Mr. President, take it off. For, for it will have huge financial impact on the little mega resources we take in our day. Adam Mutuak Hilo speaks for the minority on energy there. Take a quick break. But before that, some of your messages on the stories we've done so far. This one says, jo uh, join News Bravo for the documentary leading to the renovation of the Cat maternity block, which has been rejected by both the NDC and NPP. For me, the applause goes to the media for their good work. The politicians are not helping the country enough. Um, you don't add your name. Hopefully next time when you send a message, you will add your name as well. This one says, thanks to the Ghana Immigration Service for the good work they're doing during this pandemic. They're really doing good work. We urge them to still protect us at the various uh, borders. This one is also talking about the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital. It says the block is a step in the right direction. At least the project, when completed, will provide relief to our mothers and all of us. I pray that Nana will be re-elected to commission this project when completed. Abdul Majid is sending that from Tamale. Some of you are also talking about the voters register, although we've not tackled it yet. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. Many thanks for staying with us. Now, some heads of second cycle institutions in the Bono region are calling for a mass COVID-19 test of senior uh, high school students before the resumption of schools across the country. They made this call after the Ghana Education Service and Zoom Lion Ghana embarked on a fumigation and disinfection exercise of all senior high schools in the region. And asked Sabe to monitor the exercise and has this report. 
The fumigation exercise which forms part of government's strategic move to curb the problems associated with bedbugs in various senior high schools across the region started at the Mansin Senior High School in the Doma East District of the Bono region. The invasion of bedbugs and other dangerous insects in second cycle schools has become a cause of worry to both authorities, parents and students. Headmaster of the Wamanafu Senior High School, Mr. Asante Thomas Armstrong, lauded government and the Zoom Lion and called for a repeat of the exercise on regular basis. We, we have applied many chemicals, but to no avail. So we are very grateful this morning to see this team uh, from AGS and government that is coming to uh, kill this uh, wicked uh, pest uh, for us. Indeed, uh, it is something that will help uh, with the leadership and the students as a whole. It is a serious concern. We don't know how to even get rid of this uh, 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 challenge. So we thank you so much. And we are, we, are, we are very hopeful we'll be seeing you from time to time. Mr. Armstrong called for a mass testing of students when school resumes in order to identify and quarantine infected students. There's something we are thinking about, that even if the, the, the coronavirus pandemic uh, goes down, as they come from their various homes, we don't know who is infested. So there should be a, a, a mechanism that... Uh, all students will be tested so that those we see to, to have the pandemic will quickly uh, treat them. At the St. Augustine Senior High School in Birkum, headmaster of the school, Reverend Father Hubert Asante Kumi, indicated that the school is preparing towards ensuring the safety of the students when school resumes. We have bought some Veronica buckets and some hand sanitizers with a little amount that we have. So when finally uh, the government gives the go ahead, you buy more uh, when they come and you be able to contain them. He also backed the call for students to be tested before school resumes. Most of our, st uh, of our students here are from the north, some from Accra, Kumasi, almost all the parts of the Ghana. So in case they are tested, that will help us so that when they come, they will not put any fear in other students. If anybody, everybody is, te is tested, then everybody will be free uh, so that we can go ahead with our educational activities very well. For Mr. Opon Techi Timothy, the assistant headmaster of the Mansin Senior High School, government should find a way of at least accommodating final year students who are currently preparing to write their final exams. If the, the disease has come down and they are all to come fine, but if they are not all come, then, then the front trace especially because for them they are going to write the voicing. Reporting for Joy News, Anas Sabit, Birkum. And on the fumigation, the, the same company, uh, the Zoom Lion, in partnership with the Ghana Education Service, has also fumigated a total of 98 private and public second cycle schools in the Volta region. That forms part of a nationwide exercise to get rid of bed bugs, bats, reptiles, rodents, among others, to make the campuses safe for academic activities when school finally reopens, although we don't know when. Heads of the various schools have advocated for the fumigation to be undertaken periodically as activities of the bed box and other pets had burdened the schools and the students both financially and academically. More in this report. The two days fumigation exercise saw dormitories, classrooms, offices and other facilities on the campus fumigated. At the Ola Senior High School, the assistant headmaster, Pius Fia Ewenam, lauded the initiative, indicating it would relieve the school of extra expenditure. Actually, with the help of the Ghana Education Service and Zoom Lion, I want to commend them for this area. They have been doing a lot. Uh, before school went on recess due to this COVID-19 issue, there was some fumigation earlier on by the Zoom Lion. And then the PT also organized one before the break. And this uh, fumigation exercise has been very intensive. And since then, we have seen that the bed bug issue has been going down. There are a lot of other insects on campus, lizards, wall gecko, cockroaches are also there. And we have seen that somehow they are under control. 
Their Woodome Senior High School was hard hit by bed bugs. The insects have been tormenting the student body and teachers for over five years. Assistant Headmaster of Academics Peter Kwame Nambia said the fumigation exercise couldn't have come at a better time than now. I want to say this is the second time Zoom Lion have visited our school. For some years back, the school has been battling with how to get funds to do the spraying. Since the government made all hairs in various schools not to, I mean, um, um, collect. collect any or to charge any fees for any students for some time now, still the students were still battling with these bed bugs. Since you've come time, since you've come at this particular time, I think it will be minimized a little bit. The senior house master of Adakri Senior High School, Innocent Satoji, appealed for an extension of the fumigation exercise to get rid of bats in the school. Yeah, I want to congratulate the government and the partnership with the Zoom Lion on the fumigation and disinfection exercise, which is going on throughout the schools. We know this is going to help the students to be relieved from the biting of the bed bugs. And also we are having this uh, small, small bats and then the bees also disturbing us in the school. We will appeal to the government if they can extend this to drive those bats away so that the learning will continue in a peaceful atmosphere. We thank you very much. You are welcome. The exercise came in handy at the Mali Senior High School where students and teachers have been battling bed bugs for some years now. This development has caused great harm and affected academic activities. The headmaster of Mali Senior High School, Jonathan Gustav Adoma, described the disinfection exercise as a blessing in disguise. He, however, appealed for a swift completion of projects on the campus to tackle the challenge of overcrowding. Yeah, the, the appeal we will make to government is um, to some of structures are ongoing. If government can use this period to complete some of those structures, uh, that will provide a lot of space so that when they come, we can spread them out. If you turn around, you see the uh, assembly hall. Uh, it has a capacity of almost 4,000. And uh, when the president came here in October, he adopted this project. And uh, he, said, he told us that he will ensure that this project is completed before the end of the year. Uh, we believe that is done. It will make our work very, very, very easy. We can even use the, the assembly hall as a classroom because that place is spacious and that will help us in our pro distancing protocol. Wallace Academy was one of the few private second cycle institutions that benefited from the fumigation exercise. Because the bed bugs infestation has extended to almost all schools. And as private schools, we have been doing our own efforts, spending money to spray them and get rid of them. So roping us in is a great relief and we are grateful. Oh yeah. We are appealing to the government to uh, extend effectively its stimulus package to private schools and for that matter my school. And uh, also consider our staff's salary in any way because like I said earlier, they have families, they have children and they have to survive. So we pray to the government to come to our aid. The head of communications and corporate affairs of Zoom Lion Ghana Limited, Emma Achinya Boachi, advised parents to fumigate belongings of their children before they return to school. My little advice to the public is that the bed bugs are carried by humans to wherever we take them. So the children. I don't know where they brought it from in the first place, but let's say they picked it from the school. They go, they, they've gone home with them. Now we have terminate, exterminated them from the school. They will be coming back. If you have not fumigated your house or disinfected your house, you are likely to bring back the 
eggs or better still even the bed bugs themselves so i will plead with everybody to find ways and means of making sure that your house is sprayed or you deal with bed bugs in your in your house especially if you have school going children in your house so that we are sure that their bags and their books and all that they brought from home will be cleared of these bed bugs and when they come to school when the schools have been also cleared then we have a bed bug free situation for the children and the environment is good for learning because when the bed bugs are present it makes teaching and learning very difficult the exercise was replicated in some other 93 schools across the region fred kwame asari join you Time now for Frontline, a segment on the show where we celebrate frontline health workers. Today we want to look at the role of uh, the role played by pharmacists in this pandemic. Joining us via Zoom is Dr. Amwabeng Konto. He's a special clinical pharmacist, cardiovascular and thoracic unit at the Kofanochi Teaching Hospital. Uh, special clinical pharmacist, uh, COVID-19 management team member in the Ashanti region. He's also the WHO focal person for the production of alcohol-based hand sanitizer since 2013. Hi, sir. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Hi. Thank you for having me. So, first of all, tell us, how is it going for people like you who, ha who happen to be in the front line? I mean, on this segment, essentially, we try to get personal and try to find out how life has changed since COVID-19 as far as your work is concerned. So let's start with that. Okay, thank you so much once again. Um, good afternoon to our cherished viewers and then those who are also listening. Um, COVID-19 has changed a lot of things in the country and then it has affected the life of the pharmacists as well. Pharmacy initially used to be products oriented alone. And so we were only concentrating on making sure patients get their medications. But now the practice of pharmacy over the past decade has shifted not only to product centered uh, services, but also to ensure that patient care is uh, guaranteed. So we, as frontline pharmacists, on the, as part of the management team, early every morning we meet to discuss um, how our patients are, discuss, uh, are doing um, in terms of either they are coming up or they are going down. And if there are any issues to be addressed, and then it is discussed so that the necessary intervention is given. The work, it has affected our work, it has affected our going home and everything, our social life, such that our concentration is more towards making sure that those who are Um, Dr. Samuel Konto there, he's joining us via Zoom, but it looks like he just froze up on me. He was just talking to us about how life has changed since COVID-19. Yep. He's a specialist uh, clinical pharmacist. Uh, Dr. Konto, you are there now? Right. Please go ahead with what you were saying. I lost you briefly, but I think you can continue yeah. now. Right. Go ahead. It's on. It's yes, on. please. It's on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so we'll try and uh, call him back on that Zoom and try to establish a much smoother uh, line with Dr. Kontor. Dr. Kontor, are you there? Can you hear me? I do. Please go ahead. Yeah. I, I, hear, I hear you loud okay, and clear, so, so um, go ahead. The... Well, the pharmacists as in get their medication reactions those on admissions we ensure that we daily monitor for any pharmacovigilance issues to ensure that they do not experience any untoward adverse effects and in fact if they do we necessarily have antidote the side effects they are experiencing oh 
what, what I hear you say is that you try to make sure that uh, the drugs or whatever it is that you need to administer to your patients are done well and how they respond to that as well. It's not been a smooth line at all, unfortunately, and that breaks my heart a lot. Let's see if we can try again. So, Doc, yeah. you're talking about your role in these times of coronavirus and how you wake up every day or I mean, well, how, you, how you start your day, essentially by having a conversation about the patients that are available and the kind of medicines that ought to be dispensed to them and all. Can you take it from there? Because all along, I've not been having a smooth connection with you. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. I have to go back again. Um, initially, I was talking about Thomas's role was mainly product oriented. And so initially, we we were concentrating on the drugs only, but over the past decade, um, care has now to, is now towards patient care. That is, we concentrated on the patient, we concentrate on the patient and make sure that whatever medicines they are on, they are, there's optimization of therapy and there's no adverse drug reaction. Early morning, you have to wake up by 5 a.m. You are up, you are moving to the hospital to ensure that the stocks of medicines are up. And then if there's anything that needs to be done before the clinical world round starts, you make sure it is in place. We also brief management of any shortfalls in the medication supplies we have, so that um, all the medication that is needed, possibly to be prescribed by our clinicians doing world rounds, is, is, is in place. Apart from that, we also go into have counseling sessions with our patients to ensure that in case they have any issue that has not been addressed, then the pharmacist will get up and if it is drug related we liaise with our prescribers and the clinical team to intervene um, apart from that we also have people in, on the research front who are making sure that if there's anything that is coming up that could help us facilitate and um, optimize therapy that information is relayed to us and know within a very short time so that we can also look at it and then in, in make sure patient uh, receives such and also if there's any problem with any medication that is even part of the current protocols uh, a group of researchers also um, ensure that we get this information to ensure that patients across the world or across Ghana who are all going through any form of treatment, especially with COVID-19, um, get the best out, out of us. Well, I, I have lots So usually I love to have this conversation. But this uh, uh, connection isn't as smooth, although this one has been much better. I won't prolong it. I just have a quick question, if you may. Um, do you have, with all that you have listed, this means you coming in contact with people, different people, or perhaps even the same group of people with COVID-19 or so on a daily basis, uh, even if it's weekly. Uh, are there any specific stories that really uh, that left an impression on you that you can share with us? Okay, um, we had a patient um, who came to the treatment center and then because of uh, the patient's exposure, he felt, she felt that um, we could not do anything to help. And so because he has seen better facilities that had better equipment, but as soon as she got there, she started weeping. So I don't align doing counseling session. I asked her, is she okay? Is she doing well? Is there any problem that she's facing that we could help? And all the patients could say that Thomas is in fact, Initially, I thought I would die here because looking at where I'm coming from and where I'm being brought, there's, it, can, it doesn't match. But because of the professionals that has been assembled at this facility, I am getting better and I am happy that I'm okay. And lo and behold, this patient tested negative two times and then was discharged home. So apparently, we realized that we are doing the best with the little that we have. And so we need support, even though what we have is okay, but we need more support to be able to care for our patients and give them every, the, the support, the, the care should be the same throughout from the first case to the final case that will come. You're doing the best with the little that you have. So this patient was coming from which country? It's a Ghanaian base in the UK. In who, the UK. Because of the lockdown, um, got was also tested positive and then because of um, the nature of his condition had to be admitted at the ICU because it was a severe form of the condition. Okay. So usually for those who get into the severe form of the condition, they need a ventilator, right? Or are there other symptoms that they exhibit? I mean, are that severe? Really? Okay. Basically, the severe form 
does not always apply. It doesn't mean that you have to be put on a ventilator. Okay. But we have ventilators on standby, um, such that if your oxygen saturation is deep, at a, um, looking at the reference range, we will, we will know that if we don't give you put on, on the set, uh, ventilator to support, you can easily um, pass out. And yeah. so ventilator is on standby. But there are other things that also put you into the risk of um, the category of you being in a severe state. And so you need all hands on board, mm. from the anesthesiologist to the intensivist to the cardiologist to the infectious disease um, specialist to the pharmacist, all on board, 24 hour, you don't blink an eye on you. So making sure that you are, you are, you are okay. Hmm. I, 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 I'm really a bit hard pressed with time, but I'd love for us to have this converse, conversation um, uh, uh, another time. You talk about doing the best with the little you have and that you needed help. Exactly briefly, what sort of help do you require at this time? Okay, at this time, we need more of the PPEs. Um, the PPEs, okay, the coveralls, the N95s, we need more. Um, to be able to make sure that our stocks are um, within the uh, our stocks are okay, because um, we realize that the number of cases keep on going up, mm. and we, we, don't, we don't know when um, we will get more cases at the ICU, mm. such that we may run out, out of um, PPEs, and so we need more help for uh, us to be able to give the uh, maximum best in terms of drugs. If anybody has drugs that they think they can supply to the facility, we are all welcome. PPEs. I uh, have gloves, everything. We are welcome to bring them so that mm -hmm. we can have enough to take care of patients who possibly will be admitted. We'll, we'll be having more of this conversation to bring this to the attention of the uh, authorities and also those who need to, who can help. But, Doc, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Dr. Samuel Amwa Binkonto is a specialist clinical pharmacist um, uh, joining us from the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital. This has been Frontline. Now, when a larger percentage of the population is vaccinated, it becomes difficult for infectious diseases to spread. A few people therefore get infected, usually resulting in fast disappearance of the disease. Scientists refer to this theory as herd immunity. Love FM's Kwesi Debra has been seeking clarity on the theory and how it applies to disease control under the topic herd immunity, when everyone is protected. In the first of a two-part interview, he, speak, he speaks with biologist and immunolo immunologist at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Dr. Mohamed Mutikulo. immune forces protect the body against enemies like viruses and bacteria but you know they can't do this without the use of IG do you mean Instagram uh, not Instagram I mean immunoglobulins also known as antibodies antibodies are Y shaped small molecules produced by the hosts in this case a human being to fight the invading pathogens. Invading pathogens could be viruses, bacteria, and some cancer proteins. Now these antibodies achieve their aim by sticking to areas of the invading pathogens they call antigens. And they, they neutralize them by stopping or even killing them. According to a study published in the journal Nature Medicine by Chongqing Medical University, China, 285 COVID-19 patients had developed specific antibodies for SARS-CoV-2 two or three weeks after their first symptoms. People who have recovered from COVID-19 will theoretically and naturally develop immunity to that virus.
President Brown filed that report not too soon. We have to wrap up here. Just a quick uh, information here. We wish to apologize to our cherished audiences in the UK for their inability to access through the TuneIn app as usual. But we're available on www.myjoyonline.com and www.adumonline.com. You can also access our streams on Facebook, Android devices, Google Play Store and Apple App Store as My Joy Online and Adum Online. There is more news indeed when you log on to the myjoyonline.com portal. There's more news. Scroll down all the way to the bottom and our YouTube link is also there embedded for you to follow our programs. Have yourself a great weekend. My name is Gifty and Dorapia. Thank you for watching.